Hans Rosling is the Professor of International Health at the world-renowned Karolinska, Karolinska Institute at, at the University of Sweden. Hans has had a tremendous reputation and impact on trying to get messages across which stimulate and educate. And he's done this through the use of technology, quite innovative solutions. He didn't want me to say any more than that because um, we've had certain props which are uh, um, such as the pointer and I'm sure that uh, y y you'll have an animated uh, talk and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Hans. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor for me to come to Leeds. In the last century, it was Morris and Felicity King who were the champions of teaching global health, and they worked here at, in, in Leeds. And I, I read their books before I set out to work in one of the poorest countries in northern Mozambique as a medical doctor. From there on, I have, have tried to contribute to the understanding of the world. And, and uh, really, my decision to focus on, on learning was when I did a test in my global health course. Some of you may have seen this before, but it was really the discovery of my lifetime. I asked the Swedish students who went, made it for medicine at Karolinska Institute, meaning they had the highest grade you could get from secondary school in Sweden, where is the child mortality highest? And I gave them these pairs of countries, so it should be easy for them. And I picked the pairs together so one country really had twice the child mortality of the other. So there is an uncertainty of data on child mortality. But that uncertainty is plus minus 20%. So when I put countries together where one is twice the other, there is no doubt whatsoever which has highest. Turkey has higher child mortality than Sri Lanka. Poland is higher there, Russia higher there, Pakistan higher there, South Africa higher there. And to my immense satisfaction, the Swedish students only had 1.8 right answers out of five possible. Of course, ignorance is the best friend of the teacher, isn't it? It makes life... <laughs> It makes life so easy, you know. <clears throat> and I did it three semesters, so I got the uncertainty range or a confidence interval of, of 0.4 there. So I was pretty sure that I knew they were ignorant, I was going to teach them. And then, one night, I was writing the report to, to the management of the university, and I realized my discovery. It's often like that when you do research. You have your results, you sit with your results, and then weeks later, suddenly you see the discovery. I have shown that the Swedish top students know statistically significantly less about the world than the chimpanzee. <laughs> because had I used a questionnaire in the form of bananas, and I'd written Sri Lanka on one banana and Turk on the other, and served them on equal plates, to the chimps, they would have scored 2.5. <laughs> so I jumped to conclusions when I thought that the students were ignorant. Sometimes we jump to conclusions and think they are ignorant. They are not ignorant, they have preconceived ideas. And there is nothing as challenging for you when you teach as someone who thinks they know. Teaching about stem cells is much easier. No one knows anything about stem cells. It's a piece of white paper like this, and you start to draw the stem cell, and you teach. You teach about the world, people have all these ideas about it. Right? It's very difficult. And it, it took me a long time to realize how strong they were. I did a very unethical second phase of this study. I studied the professors that hand out the Nobel Prize in medicine, my colleagues, and they were on par with the chimp there. <laughs> So the Department of Human Resources got very interested and they thought perhaps they could introduce more chimps in the teaching. You know. <laughs> but with all this animal care now, it is as costly to keep a chimp as a professor at Karolinska Institute. <laughs> so they lost interest in my study. Um, the former president, Hans Wicksell, who was the head of the Nobel Assembly, he said, when you travel the world and show these embarrassing results, please tell them that I had four correct answers. He said, so <laughs> I, I promise him to do that. But even he mixed up Sri Lanka and Turkey. You know? In Sri Lanka, grandmother can read. In Turkey, we have all the inequities that increase child mortality. Gender inequities, ethnic inequities, geographical inequities, income inequities. Turkey is a great country. They are doing enormous success. But they have one rural uh, up-mountain part with Kurdish illiterate women without any relative in West Europe. 
That's why you have the child mortality in, in Turkey. Where the Sri Lanka, yes, have a civil war, but it's a civil war where both parties are serious about protecting their children. It's just an enormous ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka. So I face these myths the students have all the time. They say, they cannot live as we do. It's the most common thing they say. And I have to tell them that this is bloody wrong. It's we who cannot live as we do. Huh? And then they tell me, if poor children survive, the world population will grow and destroy the environment. This is the most com common comment you know, we get. I was uh, yesterday afternoon with The Economist in London, and they said it is the most common email they get when they write something about improving child survival in the world. It's so much. And, and the correct thing is, if poor children die, the world population will grow and destroy the environment. Because love is bigger than death. And if three children are lost, you get four more children. And population keeps growing. They haven't learned. We, our schooling system failed to teach basic arithmetic and demographics. And we still portray the sort of Holocaust idea, let's kill them. And th this, is, this is very strong. Myth three, people in the rainforest live in balance with the environment. No, not at all. It's a nasty place to live. They are killed by the environment. <laughs> the highest child mortality in the world is people who live in the rainforest. That's why there are so few in the rainforest. There's romantic views about the world. Huh? And the gap between the rich and the poor is growing. No, actually it's not. But the disparity between the richest and the poorest is growing. But the big chunk in the middle, three billion, are moving very fast forward in, in economic growth. So this is what I have to face. And I, I found out that beside this quantitative research on the teaching challenge, I do qualitative research. In Sweden, you have a Kadamuma bun, the Swedish bun, which is very popular. So you serve the student that in the break. Uh, they get very happy because the university pay for their coffee and their, and, their, and their biscuit, you know. And then you go around and listen what they say. It's the most efficient way of evaluating a lecture. Just keep, keep quiet. I've done some anthropology in my research. Keep quiet and go around listening to them. And then they say, we can, they cannot live like us. And, and they talk about the Western world and the developing world all the time. So coming back to class, I challenge them and say, what is the criteria for the Western world you kept talking about? Well, well we were never taught criteria. Developing one, no. So where does Turkey belong? Where does Cameroon belong? Well, we had problem-based learning, so we don't know these countries. <laughs> <laughs> we had this fantastic problem-based learning. We put a sign on one wall in our, in our classroom. They said Western world, and on the other developing world. And then we put drawings and photos on these two sites, you know. And then we served lunch. And those on the de Western world, they had a very nice lunch. And those got rice. And then we started to fight, you know. Ah, it was the <laughs> best class I ever had, they said. Huh? And I forced them. And finally, they say Western world has long life and small family. Developing world has a short life and large family. Now I like it. Because, ah, this is what we had. On the, we had this family, a very big family on one side, you know, and small family on the other. And one had grades, and the others didn't have grades. So, so, so uh, this is where I see it. I have to reach them somewhere. That is where we develop the software trend alliance. Well, actually, we is wrong. This is just done by pure child labor. It's my son and his wife that dropped out of university. And you see the importance of dropping out of university <laughs> to advance in technology. Huh? He went into the shop. He bought director and macromedia manuals, which are not taught at universities because they are too modern, and they were not at that time. Huh? And then he sat down and wrote this. And, and to this day, then, he hasn't had one hour of training in computer science. And now he's project leader at Google, continuing to develop this. So this is a real challenge. It is in computer games that the new animation and technology is being developed. It is not taught at universities. We had to go via Silicon Valley to be invited into the technological universities in Sweden. It's a real difficult to keep up when fields move so fast. So what do we show here? We show here. And here. I have another very good teaching device. You know. uh, many use laser pointers. I've never understood why. They are a catastrophe. Uh, even here, we had a problem. We tried to, to find out the way, and eventually, there was a teaching <laughs> technology. There was, you know, this is, this is really good technology. So you can, you can use this here. 
they were very nervous here, you know, that I would get hurt. And why is this so funny? Because academicians never stand on ladders, only working class do. You know? <laughs> Each bubble here is a country. The size of the bubble is the population, and the color of the bubble is the country. And, and, and what we show here, this is obviously India, that is China, the big bubble. The big bubble up there is US, and this is Japan. These brown bubbles are Europe. And on this axis, I show what the students said, the size of family. Fertility rate. You see seven children per woman, five, three, and one child per woman. And here the length of life, life expectancy, three, 30, 50, 70. Eh? I really like that we could find the ladder here, that there was such advanced technology in Leeds here. So, because you should be in the image when you talk. Have you ever seen the weatherman in TV standing beside the map? So you have to have two TV sets? That's often how we do when we project images. Actually, you could, you could walk in them. That's the way we did when there were blackboards, when there was a map which came down from the ceiling. Now, my teacher was standing in front of the map, t teaching about how great Alexander was approaching Asia in his war and so on. Now, so this is 1950, and the students were right, weren't they? There was a group of developing world countries that really had large families and short life. And there was the Western world up here, to which they include Japan. Uh, uh, which had really long life and small families. But this was 1950. And I have found that uh, students, at least in Sweden, they have the world view of a world as it was the year when their teacher was born. <laughs> so that's why we did this animation software, where I now can show you what has happened in the world. And think yourself, because these statistics are very good. We have very good data on the size of family. In the census, it's very easy to obtain. You approach the home, knock the door, door opens, the kids come out, and you count them one, two, three, four. <laughs> it's a very straightforward survey method. Uh, life expectancy is more difficult. You have to stand, interview people. The uncertainty is plus minus 10 years. But the pattern, we know, 1950. We had a divided, dichotomized world. What is it today? Has the developing world got longer life and live up here? Or have they smaller families who live up here? Or are they here in the few in-between countries we had? We had some very few in-between countries. One of them were Hong Kong, and the other was Cuba. Well, see, Cuba, 1950, when Custer was still in university, was closer to US than to Brazil. So much myths. When we look at the world, it's ideology and myths. It's not facts from school. And, and now I'm going to start the world. And here we go. And you can see year by year, China is getting a longer life. India is getting a longer life. The Arab countries are the green here. The life is getting longer. This is the Latin American countries and the US here. This is Europe. And Japan is doing really well, really well over there. <laughs> and now you can see how China also is doing well. Under Mao Zedong, life got longer there and longer. And now family planning is coming. And the Chinese family planning is doing quite well. They are moving over in this direction. And here you have India lagging behind Indira Gandhi trying to start family planning here, Bangladesh still with the African countries. Now the Arab countries have a long life in 1980, and they start family planning also. The imams start to agree on family planning, and they move in this direction. Look at Bangladesh, how well they are catching up with India, <laughs> in spite of still having a low life expectancy. They are going here. The African countries are now splitting. South Africa is over there, but in the 90s, you can see the HIV epidemic bring down the life expectancy of South Africa and many of the other African countries, while the the rest of the world moves up to this corner here. And China is already there where Europe is. And now today, we have a completely new world. This is the big change. <laughs> and why do we have UK is there? Huh? And, and uh, Brazil is there. 1950, United Kingdom, 1950. Here we go. Were you aware of that? No. There's an enormous catch-up which has taken place. The one I used to show in United States is this one. I go to 1965. I de You see how nice this software is? No pop-down menus. Computer. <laughs> 
computer games is clicking directly on. We developed this by my son doing extreme programming, having, having a, a new version every second week. We sent it out to five students. They came in the evening, they got a pizza, each of them, and then they criticized it. And that's how we managed to take away it. And we created a system where every pixel carries information. Every color change carries information. And, and uh, you can see the United States there, and you can see Vietnam. No, that's Ivory Coast. Vietnam was there, 1964. Uh, and the tragic war started between these two countries, and this is what Vietnam has done, system. Vietnam has very good data. Vietnam today is like the United States, 1980. And I had Al Gore jumping the stage after a presentation, shaking my shoulders and saying, I didn't know that. I didn't have the slightest idea. And that's Al Gore. Then you can imagine the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> because he really liked numbers. He's a number crunchy. So it means that the world is being driven forward by people who don't have a windscreen on the vehicle they are driving. We don't see what is happening in the world. Now, this is, uh, this is of course, what do I show here? This is the bedroom, whether there's pillow talk and soft decision between husband and wife on how many kids they should have. And the world is full of modern families. And they say, our children shall have shoes, they shall go to school, they shall have a guitar and a ball, and once we shall go to the sea with our children. The world is full of modern family. Eh? And, and at the same time, um, post-industrialized kids m have myths about rainforest being a lucky place. It, it, it's enormous, easy to be professor of global health. I recommend everyone to choose this topic because the, the difference between the reality and what people think is so very, very different. So what about incomes? What about income? We had the great difficulty in showing income because it's so ideological. They say, no, the world is getting more unjust. No, it's getting less unjust. The whole fight about globalization. And we were thinking about different animation. It was not the technology which is difficult. The difficult thing is to invent the image, the animation in which you're going to show it. We decided to show only income here on one axis, dollar per day, and we had to make it logarithmic, and it's fairly simple. You don't write logarithmic. You just show one dollar, ten dollar, hundred dollar like that. Just to make this axis, it is about 22 iterations until we, we, we get the, the axis right. And then how do you show, well, you show a person falling down. That person has ten dollar a day, eh? and you have to have a unisex uh, icon for persons. And now we ask all people in the world, please come down, come down, everyone stand on your daily income so that we can sh see the distribution of world income. And this becomes quite intuitive, that there are people on incomes all the way. There is a little hump, the post-colonial hump, but there is no gap between the rich and the poor. Eh? There is a disparity from the poorest to the richest that is wider than ever but there is no gap. And where is the money? How could we show that? Well, let's hear. This is a coin. Everyone understand that is a coin. And when thunder strikes, the 20% richest will get 74% of the money, and the, tw tw excuse me, the 20% poorest get 2%. So it's not a dichotomized world. We have a quarter of the world economy in middle-income countries, and there it's where we have more than half of the growth today. And aid is something that these people give in small amounts to these people. Uh, and, and three to four billion people are in between and they manage on their own. They don't give aid, they don't get aid. And, and that's of course mainly Asia. Uh, so how can we show where the countries are? How do you show a stacked distribution? Well, with animation, you can let Africa fall down like that and then the OECD fall down like that and then uh, Latin America fall down like that. If you put them, people would think they are behind. This is how to show that you stack them. And you see also the design of the movement there is very impo important. So you, you really understand that they lie on top of each other. There you have the world. Eh? But I go backwards to when I was a student. In 1970, I did public health in Bangalore in southern India. And that was changed my worldview. Most of the poor people in the world were in East, Southeast Asia or in South Asia. And Africa was really not poorer than Asia. This is how it was. Latin America had all incomes in the world, and East Europe were trying to overcome the Soviet bloc 
the West Europe and North America, the OECD countries there. And this is what happened. The animation shows how population growth and hundreds of millions and billions is coming out of poverty. And people are slipping back into poverty in East Europe. And if we look at the projections today, this is where we are. This is the way you should show income distribution. I can run a consultancy for right-wing globalization huggers, and I can calculate a ratio which shows them that the world is getting better. And I can calculate another ratio with logarithmic scale to the left wings who hate globalization. <laughs> but with I show animation, I show all the pixels. And this is not Donald Duck. Here we can hide now the reference to the good economic survey where they have merged all the household interviews in the world. So you can create layers like this. But this is a fixed data set in the software, you know? And it's, it's, not a, it's not a technology where you can import different things. We built this in Slash. And, and you can also move on, you can move on here to, to uh, where are we over there? Yes, you would like to change this. So you take away the dollar per day there, and you take in GDP, and then you can morph. It's called morphing this. Yeah? Never switch from one image to the other. But we show now the GDP per capita in South Asia, in East Asia, the size of the bubble is the population, East Europe, and Latin America is almost like East Europe today. OECD is there, and Africa is there. And please, can the Arab states form their own bubbles now from Africa and there? And it's come down. It's quite cute, you know, what you can do there. <laughs> uh? And, 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 uh, and, here, and you see every, every pixel carries information. Like now in BBC, all these fantastic animation in BBC, you go like this, they never carry information. They just brand, brand, brand. All TV use animation and graphics to brand, not to inform. Huh? And, and, and here we now, oh, sorry. I, I, I can, can go a little slower here. Boop. Uh, no, jump up. I put on this axis here, I put child survival. Healthy is up and sick is down. This is actually the graph I distributed to you. Huh? Same sort of axis. It's the new world map. North is healthy, south is sick. East is rich, west is poor. Huh? And, and Africa is there, India is there, East Asia is there, Arab states, East Europe, Latin America, and OECD. It looks like a gap. The students shout, see, that's the gap. We told you. Huh? And, 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 and health is there, bad and good. But what happens when I split the countries? I will split sub, and you see, there's not so much people in sub-Saharan Africa. If there's problem in places in sub-Saharan Africa, it's not so much people. When I split sub-Saharan Africa, it hatches like that, and then it goes away. And you see the difference between Sierra Leone and Mauritius. Huh? Mauritius was the first one to have a free trade agreement, and they could sell sugar and textiles on the same conditions as, as Europeans. And Ghana is somewhere in the middle here. Huh? And then these are all interactive, so you can, you can you can look at them like this. And, and we split South Asia here. Uh, and, uh, and you get Afghanistan there, Sri Lanka. Remember Sri Lanka from the shimp test? Uh, grandmother can read, so they are very healthy. Uh, and then Arab states, well, same religion, same culture, same geography, and yet so different. One hour's flight from Sanaa in Yemen to Dubai in United Arab Emirates, and two ends of the world. Uh, you cannot divide the world in Western world and developing countries. Neither can you talk about continents. Eh? You have to learn the different countries. I have a joke which I use for this. I tell them about my neighbor that knows 200 types of wine. You know, the name of the grape, the temperature, everything about them. I only know two types of wine because I'm not interested in wine. I know there's red and there's white. Whereas my neighbor only knows two types of countries, Western and developing. Whereas I know 200. I know the child mortality, the literacy rate, the gross national product. And there is no digital divide. There is a continuum in access to digital information. We already want to portray it as a dichotomy. It's a colonial uh, reminiscence in the head that we want to create dichotomies in the world. Look here when I split the whole world. This is how it is. It's a continuum, as you see on this graph. There are countries all the way. All the way we can find countries. And, and, uh, and they move also in very specific ways. Look here, this is the world in 1960. And here we move, we move it now. You have money, you can see Mao Zedong make China, China healthy, then he dies, and Deng Xiaoping make them rich there. You know? It's very easy political science. Leftish government to the left and rightish government to the right here. Huh? And, and, and you can portray countries like this, and, and then you can. You can uh, 
select and, and you can go back and ask a really interesting question. That is not whether Turkey should join the European Union. I mean, that's a three-year thing to discuss. The interesting thing is, can Uganda join the European Union? Right? And Uganda was there in 1960, and South Korea was there in 1960, and Portugal was there in 1960, and this is what happened. Uh, sorry. Uganda had some really bad decades. And then they are going on, they now have economic growth, they have improved health, they have controlled the HIV epidemic, and Uganda today is where South Korea is. And South Korea has catched up and overtaken Portugal. So the correct answer is yes, Uganda can join in 40 years if they follow the route of, of, uh, of uh, South Korea. The danger here is, of course, that I, I, use, I use averages of countries instead of showing the disparities within countries. If I split South Africa, into the 20% richest in South Africa and the 20% poorest. It goes like this. And Namibia, that little country, have within itself all the life conditions in the world. And there is Uganda. And, and there is Niger. Two, three African countries, and you have the whole world variation within them. And yet you want to have a policy for HIV in Africa. It's, it's very strange how... how, how what a lack of seriousness it is when we discuss global issues. Vietnam doesn't have so much different, whereas Brazil have a lot of different. Now, it would be very nice to continue and click, and that's, of course, the vision we have, to get all public statistics available in this way uh, in, in, in the data. Now, what we need, however, is to change the mindset. Eh? The mindset uh, and, and the family statistics, which I show here in the rainforest, eh? There were two, ma mom and dad got two kids. In agriculture, death was falling, industry was falling. This is one way of showing, of showing the demographic transition. And, and the world has come very far down in this, and almost all countries are down here. And this is the mental, the mental model we have. It goes back to empires and barbarian, and the Scots and the Swedes know where we belonged at that time. <laughs> uh, uh, and we are still sort of proud and ashamed for it. We don't really know how to handle that <laughs> part of the history. Colonies and empires, and then developing and industrialized. And today we have to have, we can't have a dichotomy any longer. It's not a dichotomy. It's a continuous. We have failed states over there. Right? And, and the main global tale is convergence. Convergence where the last billion doesn't move. We still have one billion in poverty. The amount of poor people is the same as it was about 200 years ago. The proportion falls very rapidly. But that's because the population grows. And, and it's not sustainable. There's too much carbon dioxide emission. Eh? And, and uh, um, did you see what I'm doing? I'm a professor who can use two fingers. <laughs> you see, I put them on alt and tab. And then I get this little window. And I can jump between different open windows. I'm running a course at Karolinska Institute for professors in learning. It's called advanced computing. And I teach them to use two <laughs> fingers. <laughs> the average professor only uses one finger. It is the next, next, next. So, so uh, you know, the convergence. This is one of the best ways of showing convergence. One of our master students uploaded all the provinces of China. And you know, of course, Henan, you know. Henan has more people than the United Kingdom. And, and we don't know the position of Henan. Eh? And, and Shandong perhaps is a little better known. These are the different problems. They were very healthy, the China, in relation to their money. This axis is GDP per capita. This is life expectancy. The fonts are too small here because this is a download from the web. Eh? But these blue are the countries of the world. And the colorful there are the Chinese provinces, shown in the different regions of China. And if we would go like, like the, the, the East region, you would find Shanghai there, isn't it? Eh? And, and, and I've always wanted to compare, uh, compare Shanghai with its corresponding thing in the other part of the Euro-Asian um, continent, and it's the Netherlands. Because Shanghai and, and the Netherlands are very similar in its geography, its history, and so on. And, and there was the difference in 1990. The Netherlands were here with Italy and Japan and Canada, whereas Shanghai was here with Guadeloupe and Chile and Yugoslavia. Eh? 
and what has happened. Here we go. Shanghai has catched up with West Europe. Shanghai and Beijing has the same life expectancy and the same economic level. And the statistic is good. I personally visited and gone through the data with the colleagues who collected. They have problem with informal immigrants, as does Netherlands and as does Britain. Eh? And, and how you calculate life expectancy on them. We have a convergence of the world, which is very, very strong. But we also have this problem with carbon dioxide. Here I can choose, and our program is made such on the web now that you have four or five hundred of different uh, indicators to choose between here. And you can change the indicators down here, and you can change them down here, which is the size of the bubble, and you can choose the color up there. And now I'm going to show you emission of carbon dioxide per person on that axis. 10 ton, 20 ton. And here, income per person. And we start 1820. And I heard in the morning news that the coal mines were being opened again in Britain. And this is Britain, starting the industrialized revolution, not far from here. And this is what happened. Some other West European countries started to follow. And look, look, the big bubble. The size of the bubble here is the amount of carbon dioxide being emitted. The level of it is how much per person. And you can see how the United States catch up and overtake Britain already there, 1906. And down in this corner, we have the little China there. See how small they were? And no one was thinking about them. Eh? And, 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 uh, and then we can compare the United States there, and, and we can run the world, and we can see what happens in carbon dioxide. And then people go out and say, oh, it's very dangerous. China is now emitting so much carbon dioxide. It's ab absolutely terrible the way it's viewed. They have 3.9 ton per person. United States have had 20 tons now for almost a century. And then they have, well, I, 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 this is an official situation. I won't say what I think about it. Huh? <laughs> And you have Al Gore, and he makes these nice PowerPoints. He gets all the Oscar, and nothing happens. I was in Davos in the World Economic Forum, and, and the Minister of Environment in, of India stood up, and he said, it was you, the OECD countries that destroyed the climate. It was you who burnt all the coal. But we forgive you, because you didn't know what you were doing. You didn't have the slightest idea that this would change the climate. Huh? So we forgive you. But from now on, we count per capita. There is no way of not counting per capita when it comes to carbon dioxide. And this is one of the typical divorce. They cannot live like that. That would not work. We cannot live as we are doing. As long as US is not lowering, why should China or India even think about adapting a more costly energy, energy solution? Forget about it. And is there a possibility of doing something, something about this? Well, this is getting out of poverty. I think I'll jump in that, that one, and I'll go directly to, to, uh, to, to this one. Huh? I want to show you this one. The, U, uh, the Iraq war cost 75 billion US dollars in direct cost for the US taxpayers. So of course, the indirect cost for the US people, you know, and those injured is enormously higher, and also for the Iraq people. But that's a direct cost. The US agricultural subsidy is 300 billion US dollar, and the federal investment in research and development for green technology is 3 billion, and the corporate sector adds 3 billion. This is a joke. It's an absolute joke when you look at the numbers. It's not serious. Eh? And the health aid in the world, of which the British government have done a good effort, I really must say, but it's still small, it's 10 billion US dollar. We can reduce, take away the agricultural subsidy in the United States for 10 days. And you can double the health aid. And you can get the children to survive. And you can get down the family size. And you can get the sustainable population in the world. The money is there. The money is really there. And she also has a lot of money. This is Hu Xiaolian, head of SAFE. You know about SAFE? State Administration of Foreign Exchange in China. She has 1,700 billion US dollar. It's the foreign exchange reserve in China. They sell more than they buy. And how much does she accumulate? How many days of accumulation of dollar in the foreign 
reserve in China correspond to the annual aid to the poorest countries? 10 days. She accumulate as much as the agricultural subsidy. These sort of numbers, we don't make them understandable. It's easy. It's primary school math. But we don't make it in this. Instead, we substitute it with myths, what we have here. So we have an idea. We have a conceptual model in Gapminder, which is a foundation now. And we try to add, add uh, content into the technology which Google is now developing and which others are developing. We are very happy that Microsoft are copycatting the moving bubbles, the trendalizer software. Bill Gates told it himself that he, he complained that he couldn't add it to Excel. But actually, it's very difficult. And why haven't we put it? It's very difficult to make a software which has a good user interface on how you convert the numbers into the graphics. That's difficult. It's not make, making the good graphics is difficult in itself, but it's 100 times more difficult to make an easy user face on how to convert numbers into graphics. Because often, have you tried to make charts in Excel? It's a headache. I still can't do it, you know, because they always turn up in another way. And I want to show years that way, and then it's number of people that way. It's, it's too difficult. The world is generating a lot of data, and we need to bring it back to the world. So we found out that perhaps we should use this little new tube for entrance in the world. It's called YouTube. Eh? <laughs> and we wanted to put in here uh, data that way. So we tried to, to say we use these softwares, and then we make videos, and we upload the videos. <clears throat> because I always look at allegory. This is beautiful music, isn't it? Anyone here who can see that this is beautiful music? There used to be occasionally someone who can see that this is Nocturne from Chopin is beautiful. No, mostly we need an instrument to play it, and we need someone who plays it. Eh? And then we can hear that it's important. I think data is like the notes, where if you can understand the numbers. We need the instruments. And it's good news that you can make electronic instruments now. So we can have everyone playing the notes themselves also. Eh? But the problem now is this disease. I've been around in the statistical agencies in countries and internationally, and discovered a disease which I call DBHD. It's database hugging disorder. <laughs> and, and I've also found a cure. It's cured by recognition three times daily. People who do the hard job of collecting data, unifying it, putting it in an organized way in the database, don't get recognition. There are three professions which you don't tell at the dinner party. It's undertaker, child psychiatrist, and statistician. <laughs> My wife is a child psychiatrist. You know? so, so <laughs> and, 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 and we have to give credit back to those who produce numbers. We found that. So Paul Sheung is the leader of United Nations Statistics Division from Singapore, very foresighted. He has started to cure database hugging disorder. And it was quite easy to get Larry Page and Sergey Brim the founders of Google enthusiastic about putting the technology at place. Google doesn't want to have content. They want to put tools at access for getting this out. So our task now is I'm a go between between the international statistical system and the software developers. And what we have now on Gapminder's web page, and kindly enough, I got the, 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 uh, um, the Internet access. This is Gapminder's web page. It's not so beautiful. We have focused on content. You have Gapminder World up here. You can click on it, and then you can get in, and you can choose the indicators yourself. We have about 10,000 images on the internet from those. We have some video lectures, and here's the interactive presentation you can download. We found, however, that it's the videos that are successful. The number of people that lean forward and click is one 10,000 times less than those who lean backwards and watch. Very difficult to get really uh, traffic on, on an interactive web pages. So interactive web pages are for the gatekeepers, for the teachers, for the activists, for the communicators. And then they have to produce it. So can we at all compete with videos on the net? Is it possible? Many people say, give it up, you know. It's just about the cat falling down into the toilet or something. That's what YouTube is at its best. That's what it's about. So I will, I, will, I will do a try here, you know. What do people look at on the net? They look for sex, isn't it? Huh? They look for money. And perhaps, hopefully, they look for health. So who would be in top 
if you do sex, money, and health on Google. It's me. I feel like Usain Bolt when I'm there, <laughs> I check it. And this is, uh, this is a demographic lecture about development in Sweden. But we did a storytelling of it, and this is the challenge. You know? We still haven't managed, we still haven't started to use the internet and animation and graphics in education. We still gather it in room and put a person in front, and then we have it as a little tool. It's really a potential out there, and we have to see how can it be used in more ways. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you. What can I say? <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Hans, indeed. I mean, obviously, it's been a very, very stimulating talk, but uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions. So does anybody want to fire off? No? Yes. So what did you do? <laughs> Aim high, shoot hard, have fun. That's what my son said. Yeah? We really need, we really need to, to, to get innovation going in, in IT and teaching. We did a big project at Karolinska Institute. We put up a lot of, of different funding sources you know, to advance in, in using IT and teaching. And then we evaluated very carefully, and we evaluated two years or two and a half years later. The most successful, without any competition, was a two and a half hour training in how to use PowerPoint for teachers. You can do a lot of things in PowerPoint. You can do amazing things in PowerPoint. And we don't use PowerPoint as, as, it, as it can be used, you know. If, we, if, we, if you see just here, this, the, um, this is the graph you had. Eh? Uh, and my great-great-grandma was born 1830 when Sweden was like Sierra Leone, and then my great-grandma was born 1863 when Sweden was like Mozambique, and my grandma was born 1891 when Sweden was like Ghana, and my mother was Sweden was like Egypt, and I'm the Mexican in the family, and my daughter was born when it was like Chile, and my grandchild when we were like Singapore. This is PowerPoint. Yeah. You can build and construct things in PowerPoint very much. And having, having upgrading the use of IT broadly on one hand, and on the other hand, try to innovate. And when you innovate, you innovate for the world, not for your course, not for your university. We had two projects simultaneously at, uh, at Karolinska. One was the 3D embryo, a very great animation on how the embryos start growing from one cell and become a fetus and become a child, and you could turn it around and see the organ, and they put it behind the code on the web page having the idea if it was successful, they, they, would, they would then eventually uh, sell it or, or use it. And we put up our stuff free all the way. And, and the deal we wrote with Google was that, that they will provide this free for public statistics for free use. The, 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 what you do in teaching, put it free on the web page and, and just compete. I'm dreaming about the situation where we get good video, uh, good lectures up. You can't make lectures with a fixed camera. Uh, I see that you have several cameras here. You have, to, you have to follow the learning from film. And perhaps it's not a 40-minute lecture you put up, but someone explaining in eight minutes the difficulty with sensitivity and specificity in epidemiology tests, some of these core difficulties. And then we compete on YouTube, which lecture is best. So the students all over the world can go to that beautiful explanation from Shanghai, or that fantastic short description from Leeds. And that, so it's not just Cambridge and Oxford and Harvard who dominate. It's just stupid in this world to have this sense that that university is good and that university is not good. We should have a fair competition, as we have in research publications. That we should uh, create, and then to film it. But the book is still there, and the lecture is still there. So it will be a compliment, but if we could compete on that. So, Get the use out to everyone and upgrade PowerPoint knowledge. That, that's one thing. The other, let innovation take place and put them up directly on the net and let it be tested and let us compete globally with those innovations. Thank you. Anybody else would like to ask a question? Yes. 
Yes, ma'am. Well, we do have it. I'm not here on the website. We have information concerning things like um, PCs for hair, infant access. What? What? We have information concerning PCs for hair, infant access. And if so, what observation have you made? No. The, the idea is that we don't have information. We just want to be, be a place where you can upload. Actually, we offer our software also for those who have information. But what we want is a unified format for information. What, is, what are you searching when you are searching Yahoo or Google? You're not searching the internet. You are searching the server of Google and Yahoo because they copy the internet every night. They open every, uh, every document you have on your web page. And that's why it's fast to search. But they can't copy the database because they are on the hidden web. And they, if they copy them, they are not in unified format, so it won't work. So we must create, but you won't create that by sort of grabbing people's database, because they have database hugging disorders. You know? they, they get so upset then. You know? so, so there must be a, a, a credits going back. People upload the data, they get traffic and credits back. And here on this axis, you can choose uh, whatever you want. You go to health, uh, and you go to bad teeth per person. You know? And, and, and here is very interesting bad teeth per person. I'm lecturing for the World Congress of Dentists next week, you know. <laughs> so United States here have a low percentage. These are 12 year old children. So bad teeth per person here, the tool tip, we get the specific definition. We want a simple one, which is seen in the first layer. And, and we import whatever data we get. The problem is that the World Bank doesn't allow us to upload the data because they are selling the data. I was negotiating with The Economist, which seems, although they are, don't use tax money, they are more interested, actually, to give better access to data. So that, that you can do. But it's still the thinking that we have just one who have the data. So when you click down there, we, we throw the traffic back to those who actually did that data. It's not our data. It's just a way of seeing the data. And if you want the data because you would like to an analysis, you click down in view data. And here you have the whole data, data set down there, which you can copy down your download. Is not there. You can create a completely new way of handling data if you build the software and you get the way structure in which people upload it. The luck with the, with the search was that people uploaded a lot of stuff free. Why do you upload PDF? Because the Acrobat reader is free. Yeah? And, and even Explorer was free. From, from Microsoft because NASA uh, the, the earlier was free. So the services must be free. It's a little like the, the sidewalks and the pavement in the city. They are I noted that in both London and Leeds, I didn't have to pay to walk the sidewalks. And we take that for granted. But we don't take it for granted that the statistics that the taxpayers pay 10 billion US dollars annually in direct cost is not accessible in unified form. There is a, a SDMX, there is among the enlightened statistician, there is a process going on. And we need that process to meet the technology. But that takes some time. Okay. Gentleman at the back. Um, I think you've, you've really given us all something to talk about. And, and it's, it's been a wonderful thing to see you and to see the graphic. Oh, sorry, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I've just got a slight worry at the back of my mind, which is about information. And, and a thought just occurred to me, I've just um, twittered it to a friend, I, th I thought that the most complex piece of information you showed us was the, the little Chopin piano piece. And there's, a, there's a, a, a qualitative difference between the complexity of information contained in something like that and the complexity of information contained in statistics. And I just wonder what you think about that. And it's, it's sort of to do with this relationship between information and action. <laughs> You're right, we'll get side effects when we make it available this way. But imagine the day when the door of the monastery was open and someone shouted, there's a guy called Gutenberg who says we can print the Bible so everyone can read for themselves. And the response was, but that will lead to misunderstanding and misconception and it will split the church. And so it did. And so it did. So they were quite right in their worries. And, 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 and you will get misconceptions, but, but the main effect, I think, will be good. And we will have discussion about it. But there's no doubt about it. And, and we have a lot of culture on how things should be. We have intentionally not put any regression lines or anything in there. 
because we, we from, a, from a scientific point of view, we, we regard this as a data exploration tool and a result communication tool. It doesn't replace any of the numerical analytical tools that we have. And that's why we didn't want it to someone show a correlation and, and say the correlation. We kept that out of it. But it's, um, it, 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 and, and there, there is, I know there's a map about London, about the risk of getting myocardial infarction in different boroughs of London. And some are really risky. Some boroughs are really risky. But it's because there's an old population, so they haven't age standardized. So, so in real estate, you know, you will see people don't want to buy a house there, so you lose value. on These sort of things you have. But we think you can solve that by having a discussion forum on some sort. We are great admirers of Wikipedia. Wikipedia is excellent compared to British Encyclopedia because the British Encyclopedia runs always the risk that people think it's the truth they are reading. When they are reading Wikipedia, they know that it's not the truth they are reading. <laughs> And that, that alert. So, so the whole idea of that there's big central stores where it is correct. But on the other hand, Wikipedia has to keep control. They have to do. And the soft control and how you choose to do that, that's difficult. You, know? you can fall into one ditch on one end wh where you get more misconceptions and more side effects than you get true understanding. Yeah, yeah, it is, and, and, and it is so unpredictable. I thought all the time that creating the interactive web page would be what made all the difference. And then I got the invitation from this TED conference in California, Technology, Entertainment, and Design. What? I said, Hollywood and architects. No, it's not serious. I won't go. I won't go to such places, I said. You know. And they kept uh, uh, coming back to me, and eventually I went there. You know. And then they made a video afterwards, and they, up, and they sent it to me to... to uh, Justify they could upload it. And I said, never in my life a commercial for cars, for a BMW, me, professor in public health from Sweden, forget about it, I said. And then they convinced me, and that was the success of my life that week. <laughs> so it's so unpredictable to see. It's new technology, new means of communications learning. It's really, really unpredictable. We have been working since 98 with this. We have replanned every third month. It's really unpredictable. Where we had the success was not where we thought. But the thing I would say, it is the real challenge is the sort of the design of the things, you know. How you, how you, make, how you make that design work. That's the challenge. And normally when we do software like this, we have one person who is the content person. I know the number, I know the income distribution. They hand the thing over to a designer. The designer, and I know how to design this, will be beautiful. They hand it over to a programmer. And then the programmer make it run. And then it comes back to the content person. They say, no, that was not, that's not the right way. And, and, and then they become enemies very rapidly, if they work in a line. You have to have that little group work together. That was the whole, the, the success was, it was me, my, my son, and his wife. And I was... I got all the credit, you know, culturally. It's always the Caucasian, tall, Swedish, public health male professor that gets the credit, you know. <laughs> Whereas it's the young people who sit there and do the design, you know, and work hard. Which is, so I've been going water skiing after them for the last five to ten years like this. Uh, uh, but it's, we, we, never, we, were, we were not fighting. We managed to listen to each other. And we had very, very short iterative loops. Very, during... Before we sold to Google, it worked like I worked to 8 o'clock in the evening. I came home to then. We brainstormed up to midnight, and then I slept for some hours. I went back. I worked at the university to 8 o'clock in the evening, and then I brainstormed with them to, to midnight, and then they worked the whole day. And, 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 and having an iterative loop of 24 hours when you develop this. And, and like, like this is, uh, this is really the 25th version of it. You have, you have to really work uh, and leave it and then work again. Much of the web design is not good because the content person, the design person, and the technology person are not working together in a very rapid interactive loop process. Uh, and yet, what we succeeded with was not what we thought. Our great plans went wrong. So we were, of course, very, very lucky. We started this when we had to give credits to Macromedia. Is Macromedia who made Director and then Flash, which was tools in which you could build this. 
But the, the Trendalyzer software is 1,500 pages of code in Flash. And we, we tried to make it in modules which we intended to put free to the world, but it didn't work because there were so many bugs in Flash. And Kevin Lynch, who is the chief architect of Flash at Macromedia, we, we eventually ended up at him. And he said, well, I'll help you. That's a good thing you're doing. He was using it, showcasing with it. So, so we sent the stuff to him. He signed a non-disclosure. We sent the, the source code. And he said, we never thought anyone would be so stupid as to write 1,500 pages in, of code in action script because programmers don't write it in action script. But this is because we are not programmers. We, you know, we came in from the street and did this because we had something we wanted to communicate and we had designers and, and my son and his wife were mostly in art and photography. So, so it, it's, uh, it's serendipity, it's lots of serendipity that brought me here. Decently I should have been standing in the medical faculty talking about tuberculosis control in Africa. That's what I should have done today. But <laughs> now I ended up here. So, so, uh, so you have to follow it and you have to test it. No big project that you deliver in the end small, short, iterative loop within the project and then out and test it on the audience and test it free. And, but keep the ownership. It's very important. If you want to give something away for free, you must own it. Otherwise, you cannot give it away for free. So be clear about who owns stuff you develop, whether it's university, whether it's a project group, whether it's association, foundation, or company. And then you decide to have a policy to give it free, but you own it. Uh, that, that's my, because otherwise you will get into conflict, someone else would take it. Even that graph I gave you, I took copyright in US very early on that, the bubble shot, I, I, I invented that 96. Just to be able to give it away, otherwise someone will claim it. Thank you. One of the audience actually has been putting up questions there on the back channel. One of the members of the audience said, um, we're constrained by technology in our lecture theatres. Is using something advanced like this in a face-to-face -face presentation too risky? And is it better to run an elaborate lecture from an internet site? No. <laughs> <laughs> People who lecture are more scared to fail than they are eager to succeed. That's a problem. You have to... <laughs> You have to take a risk, and of course, I, I have run some sort of performance skill, but, but the more you simplify, the more funny you are, the more you are loved until the audience suddenly hates you. And then when they hate you, they really hate you. <laughs> and people sense that they want to keep safe, so they don't want to simplify and make too many jokes, and, and you have to read the audience to do that. So of course, lecturing skill is, is a thing of itself. Often I think we promote problem-based learning because we have bad lectures. It's always stupid to compare a bad version of one methodology with a good version of the other. Uh, Problem-based learning is very costly. The economy of it is very costly when you should have teachers to sit around. And we crashed the economy of our medical faculty because we have our teachers spread out in the whole of Stockholm and the traveling of teachers broke the economy. We lost too many working hours for them. Uh, it's much better to put people in an auditorium like this and put a good lecture here. This is how you save budget, for God's sake. And then you can use that for something which is effective. So, so many of our courses, we try to, to lump the students together in 200s. And then we run them in small groups. But we have too many courses, which is 30 students all the way through. And that doesn't pay off. You have to do the economics of teaching and how you do it. And, and um, well, actually, I mean show business. So that's, uh, you, you, have to, you have to try to, to combine that. Uh, and, <clears throat> and it's also interesting that the, uh, the, uh, the financing structure of Karolinska Institute is very nice. You, get, you become professor, there's no money to pay your salary. There's no money to pay your salary. The department gets money based on what you produce. You produce PhD students, you get money, you produce associate professors, you raise uh, research grant, you get money, you run courses, you get money. You do external lectures, you get money. So you can do what you want. I think it's very dangerous to have this. You have a fixed position, and then you should do so much teaching. That's stupid. Half of the researchers should never teach. <laughs> never, ever. <laughs> eh? And others should teach most of the time, or you should divide your life in periods. There's too much prestige. I decided, yes, to, I've written my 100 papers, and I decided to stop doing research. It's very difficult among the professor. You don't have run any papers? And they're like alcoholics, you know. You don't drink anything, they say. 
You don't have any grants? No, I decided to stop it. Now I'll run GapMind. I'll do that. I, I'm, I'm going to create, like, uh, I handle data like the herbarium. Uh, astronomers, I greatly uh, admire astronomers that collect in unified format their observations and, and so on. I'm, I try to do that function. But that, that was because of very foresighted structure. Too much of academic life is about getting tenures and position, and it's so boring. It's so boring. And once you get 46 and you get the permanent position, then you hang on it for 19 years until they get rid of you. Uh, and, and you burn a lot of money. So it's, it, it, and that doesn't work. And if you can, can teach, uh, uh, if you are good at teaching, you should be able to fund yourself on teaching then and, and, and to, to, to merge a team of people and, and be good of it. But it's very much, you have to, you have to look at the financial structure of how people are employed at universities if you want innovation in teaching.